Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. Today, my guest is Lindsay Delorier. Lindsay, how are you? I'm great. It's great to be here with you, Melinda. I am so glad that you agreed to sit down and talk with me because you are the co-owner and president of the Bolton Valley Resort. And I've been wanting to interview you for a really long time. So we have a lot to talk about today, Lindsay. And um, to my viewers, um, hang in there because this is going to be a wonderful ride. I've known Lindsay for probably 15 some years, 20 years, and um, you're one of my favorite women. So here we go. Lindsay, share with my viewers a little bit about your childhood growing up and, um, and about your family ski area. Well, I mean, I had the amazing good fortune with my brothers to grow up up here. My father was the original developer of Bolton Valley. And by the time I was born, <laughs> Bolton Valley was built and operating. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Bolton Valley was built and operating. And um, and so I got to grow up here working at the ski area, you know, working, starting as stuffing envelopes when I was probably six or seven and then <laughs> And then, you know, moving through a lot of different jobs growing up and through high school, skiing, and it was great. We were I mean, really lucky. To grow up in a, on a ski area as a child, you must, you must be a pretty extraordinary skier. I'm all right. I'm better than average, probably. I'll bet you are. I'll bet someday, we're, someday you and I are going to have to. Actually, Rick asked me the other day, he said, look, we've got to get over and ski Bolton. Yes. And so I'm going to get over there and hopefully you'll take a run with me. Um so talk to me a little bit about who's been your inspiration throughout your throughout your life. Um, who's who's your greatest inspiration? Well, you know, I I guess when I think about that, I don't. There isn't really like a famous figurehead that I've looked to throughout my life or anything like that. But I think I've had really good role models much closer to home. You know, both of my parents were working parents growing up. My father ran the ski area, and my mother ran um, a property management company that. Um, rented out all of the condominiums, which back then were short-term rentals. And so both of my parents were business owners. Um, they both worked close to home. We lived here on the mountain and both of their businesses were here. Um, so we had a lot of access to them, which was lovely, but they both worked a lot. And, um, and so, you know, I would say as far as that's concerned, really probably my best role models growing up and still were my parents. But then also I've got, um, I'm the second to youngest out of five kids and there's quite an age gap between us. So my two oldest brothers are actually quite a bit older, about 15 years, 15 and 16 years older. And so both of them have really been great role models for me growing up too. You know, they're both just, I mean, in addition to being successful, they're both just such kind people. I really come from a, a kind family. and um, And so I think, I would say, you know, in terms of how I think about who I am and the values that I have, so much of it really just comes from my own family, M much more so than, you know, say, say a famous figurehead who inspired me from a distance. Well, you know, most, most people, most people go there. Most people say it was my uncle Joe, or it was my mm -hmm. aunt or my grandmother. It's, it's so, it's not, it's not surprising that most people find their greatest inspiration from people within their own family. So this does not surprise me because you do have an extraordinary family and they are kind and generous and loving. And mm -hmm. so that doesn't surprise me. So in talking about your values and your mission, one of one of your careers coming out of um, out of school, out of college was um, was to become the executive director. And I believe you were founding, founder member and executive director of Main Street Alliance, Vermont. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was on that board with you, which is when you and I first connected. Talk a little bit about your work in the nonprofit world. Well, I got into it kind of backwards actually, because when my daughter was young, I actually had a teaching license, but I wanted a job that had a little bit more flexibility with hours. And so I found myself you know, work found my found my way into the nonprofit world, and through that work, um, I backed into advocacy, and then really fell in love with advocacy, and was fortunate enough to get a job as the staff lobbyist for a children's policy organization, which was how I first um, learned the art of lobbying, I guess. And then from there, I was really inspired to um, create the Main Street Alliance of Vermont. Um, in part through our work on paid sick days, which 
was um, a campaign in Vermont, which was successful ultimately to ensure you know, that every Vermonter, every working Vermonter is guaranteed a certain number of paid sick days. And um, <clears throat> the gap that that campaign really illustrated for me was um, the opportunity opportunity to do really grassroots organizing within the business community to build not just support for issues, but really to try to, you know, find, to engage those business owners, to try to find the pragmatic and realistic solution that would both, you know, in this case, provide a great benefit for their employees, but do it in a way that would work for the businesses rather than having the two sides pitted against each other. And so, with you and another, and you know, a group of sort of other founding businesses, we created that nonprofit with the idea not just to be sort of a left flanking support arm, but really to be um, a group that could forge a, a strong compromise on that issue and on other issues. And you know, that's really a reflection of my own political views as you know, sort of a left leaning but moderate. Um, you know, person who 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 wants to be values led, but who understands the constraints that do exist. And so, you know, I want to take in that role and in creating that organization. The objective was really to was to um, convene a table where compromises could be could be hashed out, and then once we figured it out, you know, to mount a campaign to get it over the finish line. And and we were good at that. You were amazing. You were an amazing leader for Main Street Alliance. And um, and from there, you segued uh, to your new role as president of Bolton Valley Resort. And so let's talk a little bit about the resort. And uh, what are the amenities that you offer as a seasonal report at resort? Um, I, you know, t tell us about all the different uh, areas that you serve the community, whether it's dining or lodging or whatever. Tell us a little bit about the mountain and the resort and all of the amenities that it offers the community. Well, Bolton Valley is really a mid-sized resort. You know, it's it's certainly not one of the bigger giants of the area, um, but we're not tiny either. We really have all the amenities that you would come to expect from any resort, everything from lodging to dining. We have a sports center with an indoor and outdoor pool, um, full rental retail, you know, rental shop. In fact, we have one of the only um, backcountry rental programs, not just daily rentals for backcountry gear, but also season long rentals for backcountry gear. We have a robust backcountry guiding program. We've got a fantastic ski and ride program, season long programs for local kids. One of the things that we're most proud of um, was something that my father created right out of the gate in the 60s, and that's the after school program. We teach a lot of kids to ski and ride every year at Bolton Valley, and we love that. And then most recently, we've been expanding into a true, uh, pretty radical downhill mountain bike park, lift served, um, designed and built by Gravity Logic, which is really the, the world-class uh, design builders in the mountain bike world. So we've got a lot going on and more to come. <laughs> we do. I mean, and, and that's that's you. That's Lindsay Delorier all the way around. So for my viewers, uh, we're talking to Lindsay Deloitte, who's the co-owner and president of Bolton Valley Resort, and you can visit her website at boltonvalley.com. Um, Lindsay, and you also offer children's camps. We do, yes. In the summer, we have summer camps for kids. Yeah, yeah. thank you for mentioning that. There's too much, too much to remember all in one quick. Well, you're doing so much, and this is who you are. I mean, when you when you land, all of a sudden stuff happens, and that's the beauty of Lindsay Delorier. You know, well, I should say, we also do group sales, weddings. We just recently reacquired the Ponds building. Um, so we'll have a very robust wedding program moving forward too. So that's a lot. You're getting married. That's a lot. And it's fabulous. I mean, it really, and you, and, and, you know, you're sort of like the little engine that could, you may be a little sort of a mm -hmm. mid-sized resort, but you do, you do very big things. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're on it, because this was one of my questions, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the program, uh, and I'm gonna get into this, but let's start first with talking about your dad, Ralph Delorier, and he was just inducted into the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about your dad and the history of Bolton Valley and how they ended up owning the mountain and um, share that with our viewers. 
Well, the very brief history was that my grandfather actually owned um, a farm in South Burlington, a dairy farm. He moved his family up here and bought that when my father was um, in high school. And so they operated that dairy farm until basically until the um, interstate was coming through. And the interstate actually went right through the middle of their farm, which um, included everything from Dorset Street to where the UVM Ag Center is to um, the Sheraton, Doubletree, that whole area was where the farm was, Staples Plaza, et cetera. And um, so the, inter the interstate went right through there and he was compensated you know, for the loss of that land. And with that compensation, he bought up, I think, 8,000 acres in Bolton with the idea that they would log. Um, that they would use it as timberland, which it was already being, it was already, you know, being logged. Um, but then my dad, who was in his 20s at the time, I think, um, he had the idea that it would be really fun to build a ski area. And, uh, and he was in the, um, he was in the National Guard. And so he was able to catch a ride, the story goes, in um, a helicopter from a friend of his, and they went up and they scouted out all the land and they picked out the base area from the air. And uh, and then the rest is kind of history. You talk about a visionary, my dad is a major visionary and he was just, you know, able to able to make it happen. And um, so we built the area. the rest is history. Well, the rest is history, but it's a big history. Now your father is also a very successful businessman. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, you know, he owned and operated Bolton for 30 years. And then subsequent to that, and uh, subsequent to that, he actually went out west to Jackson Hole for a while and uh, did some hotel development out there in partnership with one of my brothers um, and my uncle, and then came back here and um, worked on some more development in South Burlington and various other projects before we all came back to Bolton Valley just now about five and a half years ago, almost six years ago. So you are your father's daughter, that's for sure. Um, share, share, thank you, Lindsay, for that um, perspective on your beautiful father, who, who I absolutely adore. Um, <laughs> share with us the very affordable skiing program that you offer to what I believe are hundreds, and, and I've done this, your father started this program. Share that with our viewers, because I don't think a lot of people know really the the impact that Bolton has in the community and in in this in Chittenden County to get kids up on skis and snowboards and and learn to to ski and snowboard yeah i mean you know i think we 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 amongst ourselves we we feel a lot of pride around you know how many skiers are in Chittenden and Washington County um we're kind of located right on the border of those two counties and we partner with you know tens and tens of schools um, with after school programming where for a very affordable price, they come up, we can, you know, outfit them with rental gear, lessons, night tickets. Um, you'll see the buses rolling up Tuesday through Friday, about three o'clock buses start rolling up. The kids start pouring out vans, parents, cars, you know, everything. It's a complete onslaught from about three to seven, um, Tuesday through Friday for night skiing. And a big part of, you know, I'll just jump back to my dad, a big part of, you know, the sort of theory that informed the creation of Bolton was really that he wanted to create a place where Vermonters could ski because growing up, you know, he talks about at being at Burlington High School, very few of his classmates really skied. It felt like it was something, you know, more geared toward, you know, out of town or city people coming up on vacation and so forth. And so when he created Bolton right away, he put in the nightlights with the idea that people could ski after school, after work, um, and that it would make skiing, you know, more accessible to local Vermonters, working Vermonters. Um, and so that's that that legacy and that tradition has been something that we, you know, we have taken seriously uh, throughout the history and the subsequent owners between my dad and us again, um, you know, continued on with that as well. Um, and so the, the kids programming is a big part of that uh, because it creates a way for Vermont kids who otherwise may not have the opportunity. Maybe their families aren't, they don't come from a skiing family. You know, not everybody has the gift of coming from a, a skiing family, but you hop on the bus with your friends, you get the lessons. And then, you know, next thing you know, you know how to ski and skiing is really a, a gift that, that it's you can give your whole life. Yeah. And, 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 and the kids are doing this from school. I mean, it's mm -hmm. part of the school. So how many schools are involved? How many kids a year are you serving? 
I don't know the number this year off the top of my head, but it's usually in the like mid thirties, you know, you know, number of schools, 30 something, 30 schools. something schools. Yes. Schools. And yes. then plus the kids to Bolton Valley Tuesday to Friday through Friday. Yeah. Eight. And we do two or three sessions a year. So yeah, it's well over a thousand kids a year. Yeah. That's an outstanding program. It's been going on for decades. It's been going on since the sixties. Yes, con continually since the 60s. Boy, you should have an event where you bring all these people back to talk about how they they would have never skied if it hadn't been for Boltonville. Maybe you've already done that thinking that you probably- We haven't done. had that event, but I will tell you anecdotally, you know, pretty much everywhere I go, or if you're in a group, you know, sometimes like, let's say you're on a panel or something and you're, you know, you, you it's the kind of thing that I can dare to ask if I'm in a local community, how many people in the audience learn to ski at Bolton, you know, and half the hands go up because it's really had been that kind of impact in the local community. And skiing isn't affordable. And, yeah. and by the way, Bolton Valley is one of the very few family owned ski areas anymore because it's become so corporate yeah. and um but skiing is not inexpensive i mean look what's even happening up in stowe with the parking and 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 it's not and it's become in some ways less and less accessible to people yeah. and so the fact that you're doing this is you know is you know sets you apart from a lot of other ski areas that are corporate driven wouldn't you say I think so. I mean, you know, to be fair, a lot of ski areas, a lot of, especially in Vermont, you know, do reach out to the local community as I mean, I know, for example, that Jay's got a great after school program. I mean, I think about Cochran's, of course, you know, oh. they're family operated too. But I know that, it, and that's just to name a couple random. Sugarbush Sugar Bush has an as a program as well in Mad River. And I'm sure Mad River does too. And so, you know, I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's unique to us. Um, I think that the ski industry, maybe not every aspect of it, but the ski industry really wants more people to ski. And I think that a lot of ski areas do feel, you know, very connected to their communities and do give back to their communities. We certainly try to do that at Bolton and I, but I don't think that we're totally unique in that way. No, but I, but I do, because I think you started <laughs> back in the sixties, which wasn't necessarily, and you've done it for so long. And I think the um, legacy is unique. Yeah. The legacy is unique and the family legacy is unique. And maybe the scope of it, you know, I mean, because also the thing that's unique in Vermont about Bolton Valley that kind of maybe allows us to have, because I don't think, I don't think that the intention is unique necessarily, but I think that because we have night skiing, we're able to have a bigger impact than other areas that don't have night skiing simply because people can come up after school. You can show up at three and the lifts aren't closing 45 minutes later. You know, our lifts run till 10. So we have time, you know, for kids to come up without having to miss school. You know, it's not a trade-off. But other 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 areas could have put in night skiing. They didn't. You did. That makes you very special. And by the way, my I'll stop son, arguing against you. Yeah, don't you argue against <laughs> yourself. Don't you do that. And by the way, my son is part of the racing program on Thursday nights. Yes, I see him often. Yeah, and he's 50 years <laughs> old and he's got a team. And I'll tell you, he's there every Thursday night racing down your mountain. It's so you, fun. You were chosen to lead Bolton Valley Resort. Uh, and you were the only girl in a family of five. Mm -hmm. You have four brothers and you're the only girl. And you were the second youngest child. And you were chosen as president of the area. Talk to us a little bit about that. How did that happen? How does it make you feel? I'm sure your brothers who probably helped raise you are so proud of you. Talk a little bit about that being, being a, a woman uh, running this. Because there's not many, there are not that many women running ski areas, by the way. I mean, Betsy Pratt was just inducted into the Ski Hall of Fame when your father was. Mm -hmm. She was an owner who did extraordinary things with Mad River. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about being a woman leading a ski area and, and having this opportunity. Well, um, I think that's right. There aren't a ton of other women leading ski areas, but I will say that on the day-to-day -day basis, I don't, I'm not really aware of that fact. You know, I don't, I don't sort of lead with my, my leadership. I don't, I don't think of myself as a woman leader, really. I think I, I just think that there's a job to be done. And, you know, I show up every day to do that job and my gender doesn't factor into my thinking very often. Um, but I know that I know that um, it is not super common. And um, so to the extent that we, you know, that women can be in leadership roles more and more often, and it can become less and less interesting. I think that that's a great thing. <laughs> so I'm happy to be a part of that transformation. It is a great thing, but it also is a break breaking through the glass ceiling. And you had four other four brothers. 
Mm -hmm. And your, your family chose you to lead it. And you may not see it that way because that's how you're, I mean, your generation lives there. And I love that about the younger women um, in this country and in business is they don't see it. But for someone like me, who, 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 who really, you know, had to smash through that glass ceiling, yeah. I find it uh, really exciting and wonderful that there are not that many ski areas in this country that are run by women and that you were chosen by your family to be the leader of this resort. And I think that is something special. And also that you're a mentor for other women who mm -hmm. may not aspire to be in that leadership role, but then they look at you and say, well, you know, um, I wanna be like Lindsay Delorier. <laughs> so anyway, I, 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 your, your humility always has been something that I have, I have honored and, and revered, but I think you need to know that it's very special. Um, I do. No, I do. I do feel that. Um, but, you know, I just think that in the day to day, there's just there's just work to be done. And and, you know, and in terms of my family and how it came to be, um, it wasn't like there was a competition with everyone vying for it. It was really just a question of, um, you know, who was in the best position um, and, you know, had the capacity to step in and do it. But it, but it also says a lot about the the um, egalitarianism of your family and the fact that they they I think they chose the best person to do it. So there you have that. Um, now uh, share share with us a little bit about some of the energy and environmental programs that you had that you've instituted at Bolton Valley. Well, it's no secret that the ski industry uses a lot of uh, energy and it's ironic because you know a big part of what we love about skiing is the connection to nature um, <laughs> and you know ideally the more we can build that connection to nature the more stewardship we build you know in people's hearts and minds you know to protect nature but of course yes the irony is that we use a lot of energy um, when we got here <clears throat> the snowmaking uh, was really reliant on uh, diesel um, and we were able to replace all of the diesel compressors with electric compressors. You know, I think, and I think, you know, the way of the world is that if we can, you know, electrify, then there are more renewable, you know, more renewable ways to provide that energy uh, rather than fossil fuels. And so electrification is, you know, one of the sort of major focuses, I think, in terms of, you know, how we're moving away from fossil fuels. So um, our snowmaking system is fully electric. Um, we, the windmill, when we got here was, um, out of commission. So it's kind of funny because it's right in our logo, the windmill, but, uh, it wasn't actually working when we got here. Uh, so we partnered with actually with David Blitterstorf and now the windmill is, uh, working and we're using the energy. So that's great. And then, um, we also, um, uh, we also, uh, collaborated with, with David as the developer, um, and built 150 kilowatt solar field down on some family property that we have on Route, route Two, which um, you know uh, we have a power purchase agreement, so Bolton Valley is using that energy. Um, and then there's other things, but I don't, you know, I'll just kind of go to the most fun ones. That I, what I think is the most fun one is actually something that <clears throat> might seem kind of small at the front end, but we're pioneers and we really love it. And that is that last year we got, we were the first people to receive fully electric, three fully electric snowmobiles from Taiga Snowmobiles. We were actually the first delivery of their fully electric snowmobiles and we're using them in our mountain operations. Our patrol is using them, uh, lift mechanics. And um, even my brother down at the backcountry and Nordic center, they're using it uh, to pull the groomer. If we ever get any natural snow this year, of course. They will use it to pull the groomer, I should say. So um, that is really fun and really exciting. And I've got to tell you that so far, so good. You know, we're kind of a pilot for them. And um, so far, we really love them. They have a lot of power. Uh, and I know that the Mountain Ops crew is loving the unique twerk that comes with uh, an electric vehicle. So. That's so cool. That's so that's really cool, Lindsay. Um, uh, so let's let's just segue to how are you thinking about the sport of skiing since you just brought it up? And climate change. I know that you're concerned uh, about it. And what do you think ski areas can do to stay alive and thrive during this climate crisis? Well, you know, one is to diversify. And that's something that we've, you know, taken really seriously. And it's a big part of why we, you know, are working so hard on building out this mountain bike park um, so that you're not solely reliant on the ski season 
you know, for your survival, because <clears throat> even before, I mean, not before climate change, it's been going on for a long time, but even when I was a kid, you know, you have bad winters. And so if all you have is just the ski season, you know, just those four months a year, you're just not going to have a good year every year. And so you kind of put yourself in at risk. And so, you know, diversification is something that you've seen um, in the ski industry more and more uh, moving into year round. And that's something that we're really focused on too. Um, and then, you know, when in terms of protecting the skiing part of our business, which I think, I hope will always be the center of our business. And certainly it would be very hard to replace, you know, sort of the the scale of the revenue that skiing brings in with any other with any other, you know, sort of um, aspect of the business. Really, what we can try to do is just sort of mellow out the the you know, the peaks and the valleys, but um, aren't really the valleys, but um the key is really snowmaking. You know, I think that's really how we're thinking about it is, you know, looking at our snowmaking operation and Bolton Valley, I will say, you know, that's really where we show our weaknesses. Um, you know, we, we have a much smaller snowmaking system than a lot of other ski areas. So we, we fight, we grind hard, like in a year like this, we're grinding really hard and it's, it's harder for us to recover. Uh, we just don't have the same ability to move the same amount of water in the same amount of time from the pond, you know, to the ski trail. Um, so for us, as we're right now developing our master plan for the next 10 years, snowmaking is really, I would say snowmaking is the centerpiece of that. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, and areas are staying open longer than ever. I mean, now, I mean, with the climate change issue, some areas are staying open into May because of snowmaking. It's yeah. Interesting. It's really interesting because it's not so much four months anymore. It's, maybe six months because of snowmaking. So uh, that's a big vision. I can't wait to see your 10 year plan. Um, so Lindsay, I wanted to ask you um, in one sentence, can you describe Bolton Valley, the experience of Bolton Valley to my viewers? Yes, I would say Bolton Valley is a big mountain skiing experience, Vermont sized, uh, but it feels like you're in your neighborhood feels so. like home. It feels like yeah. home. And all that kindness and and uh and compassion and 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 giving that your family has done for, you know, 50 years. Um it shows when you're up at Bolton, you feel like you're 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 home. So I will say that, you know, the, some of the like the most consistent feedback we get from our skiers and our riders is just how great it feels to be at Bolton Valley. You know, just the the energy, the vibe, um it really, we're very simple. We're, we're a little scrappy, you know, um, but, but people love it. It's so it, it's, it, we really are down to earth in part because we have to be, because <laughs> we don't have the deep pockets and massive resources. So, you know, but, um, but the people who are up there, the people, our staff, the people who are working up here, they love Bolton, you know, they are connected to Bolton. It means something to them. Um, everyone who works here works here because they have a personal special connection to Bolton. And I really think that that comes through. Um, you can feel the commitment and the love, um, from our staff it's personal for them. And then that makes it personal, you know, that makes it a personal experience for everyone who comes and skis here. And, and that just feels different. Beautifully said. Uh, what words of wisdom would you give girls today on being a leader and following their dreams and aspirations and attaining their life goals? Well, I think the main thing that I can say is, um, you know, to just go for it. And, you know, I, I, I read a lot of, you know, we read these studies about, you know, how women relate to um, applying for jobs or going for big goals. And there's, you know, the feeling this, it's almost become a platitude, but this notion that you, that women always feel underqualified to go for something. I guess I would just say, you know, for myself, it's certainly true that I've never known what I'm doing when I start doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly didn't know how to run a ski area when I agreed to step up. I, you know, didn't know how to start a nonprofit when we did that or how to lobby when I got my first job as a lobbyist. And I think that that's a big part of success is just trusting your ability to figure it out and being willing to figure it out. At the same time, having the confidence not to have to pretend that you know something that you don't know. I feel like, you know, one of the lessons that I really learned from lobbying was, um, to be, to be very comfortable when I don't know something because I'm confident that I can learn it. And so, 
you know, I think that even if you're in a leadership position, it's okay to ask people who are working for you to educate you. Um, and it's okay when you're not in a leadership position to acknowledge that you don't know something. Um, and as long as it's backed up by the absolute confidence that you can figure it out, you can. And, you know, I feel overwhelmed a lot, but I got a piece of advice from someone years ago um, who just said, you know, when even when you feel overwhelmed, just check off three things on your to-do list that day. It doesn't matter. Three things, it's a small amount of things you can just, as long as you can just say you're doing three things a day. And, you know, obviously some days you do 40 things and some days whatever. But the point is forward motion. You know, it feels like you're moving slow uh, sometimes for sure. But as long as you just keep pressing forward, pressing forward, pressing forward, you know, when you take the moment to look over your shoulder, you'll be surprised how far you've come. Um, and I guess that's what I would say. Well, Lindsay, you are an inspiration and um, I so admire you. And I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, to speak with my viewers again, Lindsay Delorier, the co-founder and president of Bolton Valley Resort, boltonvalley.com. Visit their website. And Lindsay, thank you. Have a beautiful holiday. And I'm going to say goodbye to my viewers, but Lindsay, I'm going to ask you to stay on because I want to say goodbye to you. So to my viewers, thank you. Have a wonderful holiday and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.